Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. From the beautiful city of Chicago, mm-hmm. my name is Eric, and I'm here with Michael. Hey. Also a Chicagoan resident. That's right. And we're doing two films today. Yes, we are. What are the movies? We're going to do Smokey and the Bandit and Thunder and Lightning. So sometimes on the show, we go on and on about the city. Yeah. And how wonderful and glorious it is living in the city. And, you know, I've lived a lot of places uh-huh. for very brief fucking periods of time. And I love Chicago. Mm-hmm. I'm going to stay in Chicago a long time. I like that Chicago has a lot of different little neighborhoods. It looks very different. It feels very different in different places. Cold, big graveyards, the usual. Yeah. And, uh, or fucking hot or just a very uncomfortable temperature. Terribly uncomfortable it's, all year round. And windy, too. Everybody smells bad. Especially in the loop. Love well, Chicago. Well, in, in Uptown, they certainly do. But that's the thing, right? Is then you can go over to something like, uh, like the Gold Coast or Bucktown or Logan Square. I mean, these neighborhoods are all vastly different. And we talk about Chicago all the time, and we live here and we like it, but we also love the South for yes, some bizarre reason. we do love reason. the South. It and will I, rise again. I can't figure out why I love the South so much. I don't know if you've pinpointed where your love of the South comes from. I don't think I know. Uh, but we love the South, and we love the fucking road. Yep. And it's been, I guess, a year since we've done any type of road film. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how that's happened either, but that's just wrong. So we're going to correct that, and we're going to do a couple road films, uh, sort of. Well, sort of road films yeah it's weird we're doing like a hybrid we're gonna basically do a show on alcohol which we're both experts on yeah um, right we're gonna do a show on cars and alcohol something that's a big part of both of our lives that's sarc i don't even know if my license st- i haven't driven in what five years now yeah. when's the last time you drove a car you've probably driven a little more re- although you're a much poorer driver i'm more than I am. far worse driver than you if we were in an emergency situation right now i haven't driven in five years and your license is still valid. I, can I do think that I thing. would drive. I can do that thing that Harley did in Thunder and Lightning. I'm having flashbacks of when I met you and we drove around and it was very scary. Yeah, we went to IHOP a lot and you lived in, uh, what was that? Normal uh, Illinois. Oh. No one gives a shit about this right now. <laughs> what was that weird town called? Peru. Peru. We drive to Peru. Again, no one gives a shit. I think I might love the South because I like excess mm-hmm. and it's seeing the South in films, it's just always about trucks yep. and... Too much fucking stuff, just all of it. Too many guns and too much accent and too many fucking trucks. Yeah. I just love me some cinematic South. So we're going to spoil these movies. Mm-hmm. We're going to spoil Smokey and the Bandit. And we're going to go ahead and spoil Thunder and Lightning. Yeah, while we're at it, why not? I believe uh, Smokey and the Bandit, everyone but me had seen. Mm-hmm. And Thunder and Lightning, I still no one knows what that is. Yeah. Even me, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and I just watched it about five seconds ago. Uh-huh. We're going to talk about both. We're going to include the endings. This is road exploitation, so... You know, I think that's what separates this is we haven't talked about it in a while because they're mostly all the same movies. Yeah. These movies are a little different. They have a, a little bit of a different twist and debatably they might not even fall into that genre, but we're going to fucking spoil the endings anyways. So I wanted to ask you uh, in regards to Smokey and the Bandit, mm-hmm. were you born in the seventies and do you actually drink a ton? Um, my answer to that question is no. Uh huh. And a resounding following no, unfortunately. So I, I like to check in every once in a while on the show. Have you had a drink of alcohol ever yet? Never in my life. Still never. Never in my life. So here, I've got this grapefruit juice. So I it's noticed pretty that. tangy. I noticed, and it's in one of those little. I don't even know what it's called, but it looks like an alcohol glass. I like to just mock alcohol in our studio. So we have all of these alcohol drinking glasses, shot glasses for our espresso and such. Yeah, but there's never actually been a drop of alcohol. Uh, I don't think in any of the studios we've maybe one or two of the studios that we've been in. Um, but I myself don't drink. However, I don't know anything about alcohol. Mm-hmm. You have all of this knowledge of the <laughs> '70s and moonshine. I, yeah, I do. Where the fuck is this coming from? <laughs> I watch a lot of movies and I worked at a nightclub. So this is such unfamiliar but oddly comfortable territory yeah. for me. Let's talk Burt Reynolds first. All right. So it's been uh, it's been a, a few months right. since we talked sure. to Burt Reynolds. Yeah, on the we show. saw him in Deliverance. Although Sam's was that, mustache. that was Burt Reynolds. Yes. That is weird. Um, I don't think we've ever seen him in the show for anything else before. Yeah. But, uh, oh God, it's so 
bizarre thinking that that's the same mm-hmm. guy. Uh, if you go back and listen to the Deliverance Last Man on Earth show, you'll hear me talk about how Burt Reynolds has two periods of his life. Right. One is pre-mustache, aka acting, and after that is post-mustache, aka, hey, I'm Burt Reynolds, I showed up. Yeah, right, right. Smokey and the Bandit falls into category two mm-hmm. of this. And so you didn't know about this whole thing before, but do you no. see what I mean now? Well, I do. But surprisingly, when you said that, I thought you were giving him a good jab about, hey, he sucks after he got the mud. Oh, no. He's surprisingly amazing <laughs> yeah, to watch. Yeah, he's fantastic, but he doesn't have to do anything. It's no, just, just the mustaches, right. it emanates charisma. It just completes, I guess, the figure. No, never once did I go, oh, look what Burt Reynolds is doing in the scene. I mm-hmm. just said, oh, there's that guy with a mustache. This is yep. going to be a great time. Exactly. So there's Burt Reynolds and also Sally Field. Sally is Field. Fucking awesome. She's great. Uh, She's always great. I love the um the pedal to metal thing to the metal floor. to the pedal and oh, God, I love the thing it. to the floor. Yeah, that's great. And she's, you know, that whole portion where she's driving in the road movie, you don't get that a whole yeah. lot. And it's just it's great to see her fumble around in the car. I, I really it. like when the the really kind of abject moment where they jump the bridge mm-hmm. and then some cops get all wet which is really kind of out of place yeah but that never happens in any of these it's about what every three minutes every three minutes movies. yeah but they jump the they jump the bridge and then it cuts back to sally field and she's like i want to jump more things <laughs> yeah. let's jump a house right let's right. jump a building <laughs> oh of course burt reynolds right on that line right. as well uh how about you jump me yeah right and she just deadpan no no yeah. reaction from that at all it's probably not in the script is why you know what is in the script though is taking off your hat yeah god we're just blowing through everything in the movie there's uh so much i want to talk about so that scene, actually, you'll notice with this movie, and we're back in, what, the same year, right? It's 77? Mm-hmm. Both these films came out in 77, which is also the same year as uh, George Lucas's first Star Wars, which is now called A New Hope, then just called Star Wars. Right, Star Wars, which I think sold more tickets yeah, than but Smoking only, the Bandit. But, but Smoking the Bandit was a, uh, what, far, far away second? I have no idea what either of these movies grossed, because Roger Corman didn't produce them, and I only know about the budget of Roger Corman films. So as a big budget, super mainstream film, mm-hmm. and uh, we'll talk about that when we try and figure out if this is road exploitation enough to be road exploitation. Every fucking thing in the whole movie is in focus. Yep. They have this fat fucking F stop. It's huge. And everything in the movie, the foreground, the background, there is no foreground or background. There's no dimension. <laughs> a normal movie is, uh, it's got three dimensions in it and sometimes three dimensional glasses as well, mm-hmm. but it has three dimensions to it in part because of lighting. And also because of the depth of field. In this movie, wherever you point the camera, everything's in focus. Don't worry about it. And there's one, one instant in the whole movie, I guess uh, a string of, of scenes uh-huh. where Burt Reynolds is taking off his it's hat. It's the take off the hat scene. Yeah. And that's the only thing shot with a, a more shallow depth of field with a smaller f-stop just to make it look more intimate and kind and you almost want the 70s exploitation porno music to cue up. Mm-hmm. It's almost there. And then they go right back into the giant F-stop and everything's in focus again and vroom, vroom down the road. So we have to get our language correct here. Because I'm just going to once again represent the portion of the audience who has no idea what the fuck this is and has never heard of this before. And I'll represent the portion of the audience that is way too familiar with the subject matter. Right. Which is just me. I'm the only one, I think. Well, there's a lot of people who actually lived in the 70s and watched these movies growing up. Remember every time we do one of these? from those people You do. You do. I was like, how do you not remember that? So Smokey is what? Smokey is a cop, a okay. police officer of the law. So here I am thinking one guy is Smokey and yeah. one is the bandit. No, it's Smokey's, Smokey's, Bears, and County Mounties are all names for cops. Okay, so those are all cops. But then we have the bandit, uh-huh. which is separate from Bandit 1 and Bandit 2. Right. And then there's a snowman? There's a snowman. So Bandit is Bandit and Snowman are the CB handles, which is like a screen name, but yeah, for sure. a CB radio. Got it. Gamer tags. Moving on. And then Bandit 1 is the Trans Am. Mm-hmm. Bandit 2 is the 18-wheeler that Snowman, Cletus Snow, is driving. A little unfair, though, that both of the cars get to be called Bandit. I yeah. mean, they're just really nailing in the Bandit. It's really... I mean, the, the movie's called Smokey and the Bandit, not Smokey and the Bandit and also Snowman. Well, not Plus, this one. The other thing about this is that Jerry Reed, who plays Snowman, he mm. has he has his own time to shine throughout the film, and unfortunately, it's only half as Cletus. 
Mm. The other half is throughout the score to the film, which I think we should touch on later. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I'd say, unfortunately. I think it's pretty magnificently. Well, I mean, I love the score, but I also really like him as Cletus Snow is what I'm saying. Now, isn't he in one? So there's a couple Smokey and the Bandit There's three movies. Smokey right. and the Bandit films. Okay. And he's like the main character of one, right? He's the main character in the second one. Okay. And then Jackie Gleason, who from the Honeymooners, the guy that punches his wife in the Honeymooners. Oh, now that's he's like always gra- funny when that happens. Right. Now he's graduated to punching wives and hating black people and gay people and all that other fun, lovable stuff. Because he's fat. So that yeah, makes right. it okay. It's all right in the 70s. Isn't that funny too? How, you know, we look back at some of these movies and it doesn't matter how mainstream they get. We always have that weird era of, you know, we probably talked to, let's just think back to our, uh, our road movies, our seventies road movies. We have something like vanishing point, Mm -hmm. or I would imagine even when we did, um, the Dennis Hopper one and, um, easy rider. Yeah. I was trying to think of Fonda's first name and all that would come to my mind is Jane. And it was yeah right. Dennis Hopper and Jane's brother. brother. And, you know, I remember at least at the very least, the stuff in Vanishing Point being about 70s culture mm-hmm. and a big piece of the the hippie movement yeah. and the resistance against the yeah. man and the same stuff we're seeing Easy here. Rider for sure, too, with the 60s. Yeah, and so, you know, on top of that, we also have this element of... A generously integrated cast. Yeah, let's, that's exactly the term I was looking <laughs> There's a lot of black people. Yeah. And the movie just sort of drops the black people in to, to say, hey, what's up, brother? Hey, here's your... Smooth. Yeah, here's your gasoline. All right. Peace out, good luck on the road. And then they just disappear. Mm-hmm. These are not actual characters in the film. It's almost right, as if the sure. film is trying to say we're sorry. It's just saying, oh, well, I'm sorry about the last couple decades They're of cinema. They're probably just apologizing for Bandit One's Stars and Bars license plate. Well, isn't that strange, too? So we have these heavy themes of the South. I mean, that's definitely our backdrop, definitely our setting. And then we, you know, right next to the Confederate flag and all of our <laughs> wonderful Southern music... We also have a complete absence of any racial tension mm-hmm. because we're dealing with the mindset of these hippie seventies, right. you know, people. So we like to see that our cop has some racial problems, uh-huh. right? Because he's our antagonist sure. here. But everybody else in the film is super fucking right. cool about it. Nobody says anything. And the movie itself, being made in Hollywood, it doesn't have, you know, Burt Reynolds and some awesome black actor that is that is making his first appearance in this mm-hmm. movie that'll it's go not out. Richard Pryor's first movie. No, it's not it's, Silver Streak or something. No, it is uh it is Burt Reynolds and then some black people hanging out at a bar right. that he's friends with. Sure. He checks he's in cool with his with black them. friends and then he leaves. Right. But the thing that we should note about the racist bigoted cop is that he's not really a bad guy. Yeah, he's no, just, he's not. He's just a grump that drives around and bad stuff happens to him. And we like to laugh at bad things happening to him. Right. Right. But there are no bad guys in the movie. No, everybody's the, okay. You don't want anybody to die at worst. You want what, what do you want from these people? Uh, you want them to fall in the water. <laughs> you want them to get wet, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. all you need. Or you want to run over their motorcycles. Right. I think the closest thing we get to evil is, you know, when snowman and Fred, Fred's the dog and one of my favorite characters, I I never give a shit about pets in movies. I don't know why Fred the dog is just, I'm watching this and I'm, I'm thinking every road exploitation movie needs a pet dog that just hangs out and causes comic trouble, I guess. So want, you know, the dog wants to get wet too, apparently. Yeah, right. Dog wishes it was a cop. Right. So the cops are there just to ruin the fun. Mm-hmm. That's the only point yeah. of police well, and that's, in this world. And that's the great thing in all of these kind of movies, in the mm-hmm. whiskey running movies, is the cops are just there to bring you down. And yeah. you know, it's not that you want anything bad to happen sure. to them. You just don't want them there because they're ruining the fun. However, if they weren't there, there would be no fun. No, there wouldn't because there would be no one to rebel against. Mm-hmm. The cops are just part of a uh, a representation of an antagonist known as the man. The man. Which we talked about, especially, I remember, in Easy Rider, and yeah. resisting that. And uh, people who just aren't hip to the culture. But everybody else has a CB radio. Everybody's friends. Everybody knows everybody's handles. They all know handles. each other. They all I mean, know we got Little other. Beaver. Everybody's <laughs> just pals on the road. Oh, my God, Little Beaver. So, you know, Snowman and Fred are assaulted at the bar for seemingly no reason. Mm -hmm. And these are paper thin antagonists. They don't have names. They don't even have a cause. How's it go? Hey, mister, your dog bit me. No, I don't believe my dog bit you. Well, it did. We're going to shoot him. Yeah. Why would you do that? And so they're just there to represent not even the man so much as... Buzzkill? uh, Yeah, buzzkill. Bad days in the world. And for the people who are watching the film to say, those guys, they harsh my mellow, 
and you you want to get some kind of revenge. So you get in your 18-wheeler, 16-wheeler, 24-wheeler. I don't know anything about automobiles. Multiply either. times nine. So you get in your 18-wheeler, and you run over the motorcycles. Mm-hmm. And that ends just one of these scenes that in a road exploitation movie, you're moving from you know bar to bar, scene to scene. What do they call the little bars in this movie? Oh, uh, no, they call them uh, choke and pukes. Well, and there's the early truck stop scene or whatever where he, um, this is the first time Burt Reynolds' character is encountering the cop, right? Mm-hmm. And you don't realize it up until that point. I didn't realize it up until that point, but he has no idea what he looks like. Yeah. And that's the whole it's kind of It's kind of back to Joyride, if you can remember that Sure, far, sure. Where the whole interaction's been CB. Right. And in Joyride, they they can't identify the driver because... Sure. Or even Duel. Yeah, Duel's the same way. You can't identify the driver because you don't see the driver, you right. see the vehicle. It's very reminiscent of that scene from Duel, but more comedic. Mm-hmm. Um, they're playing on the same gimmick. You know, he's in that... He's in the same fucking diner. Yep. I mean, they're at the same Greasy Spoon spot. And they uh, and he just doesn't know which guy it is. And so this time the tables are kind of turned. It's Burt Reynolds character. It's the bandit who, you know, who has the upper hand here in a way. I mean, he looks a little nervous when he first gets his little grocery bag thing back, his little uh, brown paper. Yeah, it's more of a doggy bag. I was going to say doggy bag, but then we had to start talking about Fred again. And well, that's what happens. He feeds the burger to Fred. (laughs) You're right. His doggy bag. And so he looks a little nervous. Oh, no, the cop's going to spot me. And But this is the last time, really, that mm-hmm. he's nervous. He just fucks with them for mm-hmm. the rest of the movie. Right. That's what the movie calls for. It's part of that comedic tone. It's part of that, I mean, the gravity's never there. Mm-hmm. It's too farcical. There's no death. There's no real, I mean, we see the worst that can happen. A truck can get pulled over and the cops can show up and say, hey, what are you doing? You can't be transporting all that Coors beer. We'll have to go ahead and take it from you i mean what you know it's not like he gets life in prison he doesn't get the death penalty they don't do they even fucking confiscate his truck chuck him in the tank for a night yeah think about what you've done it's even comedic when he's caught so i wanted to talk the road exploitation element Mm -hmm. because road exploitation i know two things on the show yeah i know road exploitation and i know that prodigy song Mm -hmm. their law which takes oddly a quote from the film but not a sample from the film right the um you know what we're dealing with here is a total lack of respect for the law so outside of the prodigy uh road exploitation do you feel like i mean i've been throwing that word out a lot Mm -hmm. you think this is road exploitation what do we have here Uh, my fear i i want to say it's road exploitation there's by comparison to a standard film there's too much driving Mm -hmm. there's too much this one guy's super cool we got the pontiac trans am you got the car you've got you've got thwarting the police getting them all soaking wet but the thing that you do have that kind of negates standard road exploitation is you have a big budget on this movie. You do. I feel like if you're going to say it's not road exploitation, you're only going to do that because it's not the type of culture that followed it. Right. And I don't ever want to get in the position where I'm saying it's too cool to be part of right. our exclusive little club. Sure. To say, oh, we can't include Smoking in the Bandit as an exploitation Because it was a mainstream it's film. Yeah. This is the second most popular film of the year or whatever, right? right? And everybody knows Smoke. I mean, Smoking in the Bandit was largely um, the excuse for Dukes of Hazard, right? Sure, absolutely. Isn't that just a TV show version of yeah. Smoking in the Bandit? And there's sequels that followed. Which, I mean, I'm not going to say you never see that in the exploitation world. Vanishing Point even got a fucking remake. But... You know, it's generally not, I mean, there were sequels not because that would have been a cheap, great way to cash in. There were sequels because people loved the movie and people wanted to go to the movie. You know, nothing about this fulfills the financial side of exploitation. The side we'll see with the Roger Corman stuff, the side that says, you give me money and in several days I will turn that around. I will quadruple that and Mm -hmm. give you back a profit. You know, it doesn't fulfill that side of exploitation, but at the same time, it's almost like someone took the concepts from exploitation and made a serious film out of it. Right. Or maybe not a serious film, but a serious effort at filmmaking. Well, really what Smokey and the Bandit kind of did, I mean, it wasn't the first movie to do whiskey running, but it was the only pop, really the only popular whiskey running movie. There are tons of these whiskey running movies that came. This is something completely new to me. I wasn't even aware of this. It's a huge thing there. Burt Reynolds was in two pre mustache. Yeah. um, White lightning. And then another one called Gator. He may have actually had a mustache in Gator. Now that I think about it, Corman produced a ton other than thunder and lightning. He did big bad mama and a bunch of other ones. It's just weird because other than its popularity and its success and its financial backing, Smokey and the Bandit falls right in with all these other films. Yeah. I mean, you're right. You do have a little more talking than is usual. And you have way too many characters. I mean, way too... 
There's more than four characters. And there's an antagonist. I mean, there's you have a pretty antagonist. clear right. antagonist. And, you know, that's a little out of the scope of the usual stuff. It certainly doesn't, you know, disclude it, mm-hmm. but a little out of the scope. But I think that's part of what led it to be more mainstream. You know, yeah. it was more accessible because of those elements, elements that exploitation movies usually just throw away. Mm-hmm. They're not worth having. You know, but this is a this is a weird thing because these movies are from the 70s, these right. moonshine movies, these whiskey running movies. And I wasn't aware. I mean, you know, I just keep thinking back to Boardwalk Empire uh-huh. as being the time of prohibition. Right. And I don't think to that of the 70s. I guess there was, you know, with Coors specifically, they didn't have uh, distribution mm-hmm. nationally. So it was only West Coast. So if you were in the East Coast... It was, uh, you know, it was something that was kind of hard to find. If you had friends going over the West Coast, you would say, oh, get some Coors while you're there. And that's why you see that type of branding, specifically Coors, mm-hmm. specifically all over the place in this movie, because that was the brand. Right. But I think you can still have fun in road exploitation movies. I think they can still be light. The ones we cover, I mean, they almost fall into dark humor mm-hmm. because of the way they end and because of the, you know, even just the themes you're talking When you're talking about you know, hippies being the protagonists and right. resistance to the man. There's something just funny at laughing yeah. at hippies. Hippies and driving cars. I mean, all the elements coming together, they just don't make any fucking sense. But somehow it feels right. I mean, if this were a true road exploitation movie, I think, first of all, the 18-wheeler would be the protagonist. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be Bert. But we also have this uh, this odd thing about, you know, we talked about the language, about like blocking. I mean, yeah. what, how does that work? Yeah, there's this whole dynamic in almost all of these whiskey running movies, I guess pretty much with the exception of Thunder and Lightning. I keep saying whiskey running, even though this one it's beer, but in sure. all other ones same, it's moonshine same whiskey. Um, you have one car that takes the whiskey and does the transporting, and then another car that basically lures and keeps the cops away. So from, here it makes a lot of sense because yeah. you need an 18-wheeler. We're talking about a lot of whiskey. Sure. We're talking about a lot of beer here. Mm-hmm. And then you need a fast car to fulfill the road exploitation yeah, exactly. type of vroom vroom. You know, you can't have an 18-wheeler making huge jumps like this. Although I'm starting to already write a movie in my head as we're talking about these things. But then we can have scenes like, you know, like the, the scene that would become an infamous Dukes of Hazard type moment of the car making the huge jump and the yeah. police car going flop and, you know, making it in the water because we have that blocking element. And I guess it makes sense. I don't know anything about the actual act of this type of bootlegging, of smuggling, if this really happened, but goddamn, does it make for cinema? Yep. So before we move into Thunder and Lightning, there's something that Thunder and Lightning wants us to remember about Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah, it certainly does. And I, I mentioned it before, Jerry Reed, the guy who plays Cletus Snow, a.k.a. Snowman, a.k.a. Fred's boss, yeah. <laughs> um, the truck driver. It's Jerry Reed, who is, uh, at the time, was a very popular country singer. I and will he take does your word for it. Almost the whole score. He does the Eastbound and Down song, sure, which sure. will be stuck in your head for days. Oh, God. And if you didn't realize that the song would be stuck in your head for days, just watch Thunder and Lightning. Yeah, what the fuck gives there? So Thunder and Lightning, and I'm really skeptical of that because it comes out the same year. Yeah, right? but the song had been on the radio. Ah, yeah, and one well, beyond and it's that, Corman, so the turnaround is like a week and a half. <laughs> sure. Well, and the music doesn't exactly need. It's not like there's someone in the movie uh, singing the music. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that could have been added in, but I mean, eerily similar. Let's just let's give it the uh, benefit of the doubt. And maybe I was thinking that banjos perhaps only played in one key or and something. And one song. Yeah, I wasn't. I guess that's not true because of Deliverance. Fuck Burt Reynolds in these banjos movies. Jesus, they're everywhere. All right, so not Burt Reynolds. Corey Allen is uh, the name beyond the Corman here. Who did, I mean, some of the recent Star Trek shows. He was mm-hmm. the, the director of those as well as Thunder and Lightning. And he did uh, Dallas on TV, oh, too, yeah. which everyone remembers from the infamous Dallas ending. I think we've talked about that before. I think we have, too. I don't know why we've covered Dallas on the show, but we have. And now we're bringing it up again. If you go over to our other show, uh, DoubleSoap.com, uh, it's where Was we Dallas cover- a soap? We cover we soap with, operas, yeah. Can we go with DoubleTwistEnding.com? DoubleTwistEnding. I, I think yeah. there might actually be a show in that somewhere. So David Carradine, who's also appeared all the goddamn motherfucking time on the show, mm-hmm. Death Race 2000 and Children of the Corn... And Hell it was ride. probably just the, oh, Hellride 2. I thought maybe I just no, made it. No, Hellride 1. Fuck you. You know what I meant. Uh, so three. Three David Carradine movies. Uh-huh. That's not, um, I, I have a feeling he's in more. I've seen, so I don't remember of all the David Carradine I've seen. I'm mm. not sure what we've actually done on the show anymore. I don't know what year we're in. I don't know what movies we've covered. I don't know. Well, right now we're doing Thunder and Lightning. Okay. So he plays Harley in this movie. He does. He's our protagonist and he's weird. 
He is weird. weird in this movie. As I'm seeing him, I'm thinking I've never seen David Carradine in a role before. Mm-hmm. You know, Death Race is strange. We barely even talked about him on that show. Right. And uh, and even in Hell Ride, I mean, there's a point in his career, probably around Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, it was called around, Kill Bill. That around that point. time, where people realized who David Carradine was and then just started throwing him in shit mm-hmm. all the time. And uh, and so he's playing this larger than life figure. I mean, Bill is a, a perfect, perfect example. You don't even see Bill in the first movie. And in the second movie, he's still, even when they're just chilling in his house, he's still a larger than life figure. He's delivering all these anecdotes about Superman, Superman and what yeah, have you. It's all Superman. And, uh, and Hell Rides the same way. He's this big kind of boss figure. Sure. And, you know, they build up to the moment where you're going to see him and then you have these heavy scenes with him. And then in Death Rays, he's in a fucking gimp suit and yep. he's acting next to Sylvester Stallone, which yeah. is hilarious. And so, you know, you don't, you don't think about him a lot in that role. And here, I mean, he's David Carradine. He's and just he's got some hair and he's got an earring, which yep. is pretty interesting. Doing some Kung Fu shit. Yeah. They make a funny Kung Fu reference. Maybe it's because I never saw Kung Fu that I don't have this idea of who I feel like I still, I've seen David Carradine a thousand times. I still don't know who he is. You know what's stranger than David Carradine and Thunder and Lightning? I have no idea. Is David Carradine and Kung Fu. Oh, is it really? Oh my God, is that weird? Yeah. When I hear about that, I just think how, it, I mean, he does a little karate in this mm-hmm. movie. He does some, uh, some martial arts, let's say. Sure. And it's a little Yellow bizarre. Belt. Yeah. Is he doing his own stunts? Do you have any idea if he... When we get more into Bruce Lee stuff, mm-hmm. some Kung Fu stuff later on, there was a movie called Circle of Iron that Bruce Lee had like started writing and shooting. Uh-huh. And then Bruce Lee died. Mm-hmm. David Carradine then assumed the role that Bruce Lee really? was going to play along with three or four other roles. Weird. In the movie and produced it or something. I don't remember exactly the thing, yeah. but he essentially filled in for Bruce Lee. So oh, there is God. some kung fu behind david carradine some chops that at least Uh, can fill a role of bruce lee i'm having so much trouble getting used to this i can't even picture it in my head i'm just gonna have to check out kung fu that's just what's gonna have to happen and then there's um kate jackson who Mm -hmm. plays nancy charlie looks looks and acts a lot like my ex-girlfriend this is the show feature show at (laughs) gmail.com jenny (laughs) this is fascinating anecdotes all right i just couldn't get over it it was weird this Mm -hmm. whole movie has been a surreal experience for me fascinating but then there's roger corman too. okay roger corman who looks kind of like your ex-girlfriend yeah thank you i don't think any of your ex-girlfriends have the internet so um, i wish my uh i dated roger corman i don't know what roger corman looks like to be 100 percent. roger corman it it doesn't really matter he looks like a, a fucking walking spewing dollar sign he's done some acting actually he's yeah, he been, has he's been in a lot of huge movies because he helped produce a lot of movies of people that went on to be famous mm-hmm. um francis ford coppola and that james guy cameron. did the smurfs movie that's the one did he do yeah. smurfs with the blue people yeah he did james cameron uh ron howard there's a ton of these joe dante I mean, joe dante as well uh we covered roger corman a little bit in bucket of blood mm-hmm. i mean that's not where we cover roger corman we've covered roger corman all over the place probably when we talked about I mean, he's been a big collaborator with Vincent Price. Sure. And I know I've mentioned all that stuff before, and we still yet to do any of it. He was involved with Death Race 2000 as well. Yeah, when we talked about House on Haunted Hill, when we talked about The Last Man on Earth, uh, at least one of those shows, I must have brought it up. But we watched Death Race 2000 on the show, and that was uh, one of the movies that he produced. And we've mentioned him in a, a hundred shows since mm-hmm. then, I'm sure. So if you had to associate him with something, Mm -hmm. I think people who've listened to Double Feature for a while probably know the word that comes to mind. But what are you thinking? Exploitation? I was going to go with cheap. That's the same thing for me. (laughs) Exploitation is the nice way to say cheap. Exploitation is is where you little money for big money. If you have about $24.95 and you need a movie made in two and a half hours, Roger Corman is the man to talk to. Roger Corman once said, I believe, what was it? Give him a tumbleweed and an actor and he can shoot a film about the fall of the Roman empire. So you mentioned the score already, but I mean, this is a great way to, uh, this is a great movie to contrast to something like Mm smoking the bandit because this is really, really cheap. And I I think sometimes it's hard to see that in older films. Right. Um, It's hard to see that in, in 70s stuff, especially. Well, because we're not, we don't live in the 70s. We don't live in the 70s. We just work in the 70s. Exactly. But you look back, and I mean, you can tell with this film, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you can tell. Yeah, I think sure. I think most people. Well, can I mean, tell it com- think of it. Think of it that it came out the same year as Star Wars. You know, it came out the same year as Smokey and the Bandit. Sure. Look at it, and the difference is very clear. I think the audio is probably the first thing to go. Yeah, whether it's I, you know, not even dubbing, but just you, it's noisy, and you have bad continuity, 
And uh, there's a couple scenes where the audio, I mean, as you're doing the cameras from the the different angles mm-hmm. behind people's heads or whatnot, the audio just isn't lining up. It's clearly not from the well, same take. There was the scene, um, the one scene where the, the, it's the church scene where the priest is. Uh, I believe he's Christian Gator wrestling. That's right. That's oh what's my going God. on. Can we just pause and you for didn't a second? Know, to... well, you didn't know the priest was, you didn't know that the man wrestling no, the alligator was speaking because the audio is so weird and it oh. seems like he's out of frame. Yeah, right. And then suddenly you see him speaking while he's like, he's talking while he's wrestling the alligator. gator. Yeah, it's amazing. So how did I not know about Christian Gator wrestling? Was this something discontinued in the seventies as well? Or I have a. Can we really, bring that back? I don't know what Christian Gator wrestling is. I don't know what it represents. It's a sport where the spectator always wins, sir. That's what it is. I'm inclined to believe that Roger Corman needed to do a church scene, and uh-huh. he had a barn with a pit in the middle. That's what I'm guessing happens, and yeah. probably had to go. Well, what could we be doing in the pit? He that... makes some phone calls, sure. And eventually, he goes. Well, there's a alligator outside. Why don't we throw it in the pit? Have some low local gator wrestling kid wrestle with it and then we'll voice over the whole thing and make it seem like it's church and he's wrestling the demon people will love to watch that yeah and it needs to be church too because it's the escape david carradine is slipping into the church nothing bad would go down Mm -hmm. in the church sanctuary yeah exactly gator sanctuary but sanctuary nonetheless the gator does get out alive Mm -hmm. they make up because they're gonna throw chickens at pavement later on they need to make sure for the animal rights people that we show the gator is is still okay Oh, a road exploitation film where you throw chickens at pave. I mean, what more could you really want out of this movie? Uh, probably putting your car up on two wheels to drive around a cop car. Oh, that's amazing, too. So of all of the road horror stuff I've seen, of every single driving-related movie, I have never seen a stunt that is just so purely... I mean, it's simple, but it's kind of amazing mm-hmm. at the same time. Well, because you know they had to really do it. That's not a... Yeah. You can't fake it's that, It's certainly really. one of those. But the other thing is there's always a block. There's always some kind of blockade, usually made of cars. Not some kind of. There's a million blockades. Sure, and if every, you don't have an eighteen wheeler, right? You, you have to do. You have to do something about it. Sure. So what does he do? He does the thing you don't expect. He does the the glorious trailer moment, and he goes two wheels up on the guardrail. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. That doesn't quite counterbalance later in the movie. My second favorite car effect they do, uh-huh. where the um the blue car, the not the convertible. The uh, blue car with the white top yeah. flies over the bridge yep. and into the water, of course, because that's where else is it going to go? It's well, a car that well, is... Well, at first it's the... Okay, so you may be confused because you may be going through... Because everybody... Did everybody get the DVD of Thunder and Lightning we sent out? No, no one got that. Okay, well, anyway, if anybody at home has the DVD of Thunder and Lightning, if you're going through fast forwarding trying to find the scene where the blue car with the white top is going off the bridge, try looking for the purple car with no top and <laughs> right. nobody in it. Right. So they go over this bridge and they cut to a shot where it's a, clearly a different car. I mean, so clearly a different car. And uh, and it doesn't have a top on it. And it's just going over the bridge. There's no one in the car. And then they cut to yet another shot where the car is going off the bridge. But now two dummies are flying out of it. Or One's next a to woman. It. So I'm not sure what happened there. Do you think they shot it twice and one time they just threw dummies at it? Or how did they? Uh, I, you know, I think I think maybe the dummies just fell out later. Because no, there were no dummies. The first, they would have had to do it twice. They had no mechanism to eject the they dummies. They would have had That's to do it happened. two times. They probably did it twice. Going, one of these will clearly look better than the other, <laughs> right? And then just use both. Because if a goddamn movie that Roger Corman produces has two takes, then you're using both takes. If you, you film them, you're using. I'm them. pretty sure directors. It's probably like um, that zip car thing, where you pay by the reel, oh, even as sure. a director. Sure. Roger Corman will pay for your movie, but you pay by reel. As long as you give him 90 minutes. Exactly. Roger Corman can get away with an hour long, but if he's producing your film, it better be 90 minutes. So the car that's on the road is this gorgeous, it's a uh, second generation 57 Chevrolet, the Bel Air ones. Mm -hmm. I don't think, and I had to look up a picture of it. I don't think the paint job is custom. No. I mean, this is a factory job. It's a black hardtop with that fucking white stripe thing at mm-hmm. the end. And it looks so cool. But they kind of abandon it. Yeah. I mean, first of all, let's address this. This does not become a road exploitation movie until the third act. Sure. Oddly, they don't decide. To, they're driving around from place to place, but we're hanging out in the places. Mm-hmm. And then we get towards the end and maybe in editing, we re, maybe they're editing the movie as they go. And uh, the guy who's doing editing finishes up you know, the first two acts and realizes they're only 20 minutes and then has to put in 
All right, so we'll go back and we'll put in some more of those, um, what are those things called, skiffs or whatever? The things with the giant fans that go oh, in the swamp? yeah, yeah. The hatchet the things? pontoon boats. Is it a pontoon boat? Yeah, skiff pontoon boat. I don't know what the fuck that is. And so they had some more footage there, but that's not enough. So then we put in an extended, extended, extended amount of time in vehicles towards the end. Sure. And, hey, look, now it's a road exploitation Break some movie. more glass, throw in some flamenco. But this is a movie that I guess is kind of more about the business side yeah. of whiskey running. Well, it's about real world whiskey running. Well, how would you compare this to something like Smokey and the Bandit? It's like Smokey and the Bandit with tits and guns. <laughs> okay, so the films, obviously, uh, one has mainstream appeal and the other is tits and guns. How is that possible, by the way? We just look at these two movies, what's included in them. One has breasts and guns and the other is the popular one. The one is take off your hat to fuck. Yeah, right. Whatever, at least that scene wasn't soft focus. I could have been bitching about that. That's true. So I guess it's grittier then. I guess yeah. it's the criminal element. Sure. Although this movie doesn't seem any more serious. No, I mean, uh, a more serious film probably couldn't have gotten away with putting a car up on two wheels. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Instead, you have a bunch of silly whiskey folk, and they're all kind of out to get each other, and they're all, everybody's thwarting everybody, right, and right. everybody's from the South and kind of silly. But there's the cops are an afterthought in this film. Yeah. It's all people involved. There's rot gut whiskey that people are selling because they need to they need to make a budget. Hmm. That's and the, yeah, that's the kind that kills you. Is yeah, that how it, that works? it'll kill you. And but whatever, right. you know, we made it. We got to sell it. It's like a, a bad Corman movie. Oh, my God. It's getting meta in here. There should just be a double feature alarm button for meta film. You should just slam on the button and we should start talking about something else. Should skip to the next chapter. We have chapters in this podcast. Um, we can't chapter away yet. There's one more thing I need to talk okay. about. Which is this glorious, what should be an icon of the film. This uh -huh. film doesn't have icons because this film doesn't have viewers because we're the only two people who have seen it. Mm -hmm. But uh, if there was an icon, or at least I'm going to do this. I'm just going to tell you what's awesome about the movie and then you can steal it and put it in your modern movie so that people will actually see and appreciate it. There is a scene where they, you know, they have all this uh, bright green alcohol. It looks like yeah. something out of a bad It's actually honeydew juice, but movie. It's yeah, I don't know what's going on. Whiskey. There. It looks like something from Jason Takes Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I expect to see bottles of this appear above the sewers when there's steam in the right. Jason New York. Aid. Oh God! So uh, they have these giant crates of this stuff, and they're throwing it off trucks several times mm -hmm. in the movie. And you know, it's hitting the ground. It looks glorious and magnificent. And that's another way we can pad the movie a little bit. Just chuck in some extra footage of David Carradine and co. flinging bottles through air and having a, a glorious, a giddy time, uh -huh. really. And then when they're done with their giggle fit, um, you know, later in the movie, we get to a scene where now it's a fucking boss shot. Mm -hmm. He's being a badass. We're shooting it from that low angle, looking up at him. He's got his shirt off because that just needs to happen at the end of the movie, I guess. Yep. They won't show the female lead with her shirt off. But, but they do clearly, get her to take her shirt off. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do, and then he gives... What's with this shirt exchange? I think it's... I don't understand. I'm guessing in the trailer, he probably says, take your shirt off, and she says, okay, and starts unbuttoning, and it cuts away. Yeah, or it could be in the script, she takes her shirt off. They keep the same lines, but she later decides, hey, I was in Charlie's Angels. I'm not putting up with this shit. Either way, he gets up there, he's got no shirt on, and it's extremely masculine earring. And um, he lights this giant crate of bottles on fire, these exposed bottles, and now he's got not just a Molotov cocktail, but he's got a 12-pack, a 24-pack of Molotov cocktails. And he flings them at the car, which lights it on fire. And it is pretty much brilliant and amazing. And I don't know how every movie Roger Corman produced after this was not ordered, directed to have the exact same fucking gimmick in it. It's awesome. And that's how we spent our summer. I don't even know what that means. We have a website, doublefeatureshow.com. We have an email address, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Jenny, if you're out there and you want to hook up again, we can totally do that. Fascinating. I guess that should just apply to all the listeners. I don't know why I'd single someone out. That was really rude of me. Uh, what else do we usually do in this thing? There's a Facebook, right? There's a Facebook. That happens. If you go on Facebook and you type in Double Feature, we're the cool one. Um, if you go to uh, donate.doublefeature.com, there's the donate deal. That's doublefeatureshow.com. I keep, if enough people donate, we'll have doublefeature.com. Okay. That's what'll happen. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Don't donate to doublefeature.com because then they'll beat us and we'll be in a, a constant situation. Oh, fuck it. So <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> just phoning this ending. In this, is, like, this, <laughs> this show is so reminiscent of these movies. Uh -huh. We need some banjo score and like a trombone. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> oh, fuck.
donate.doublefeatureshow.com. And you go on there and you give us some cash and uh, we get to keep doing the show. You get to keep listening to the show, which is more important to you. Yeah, that really is. You don't care if we do the show. You just want to listen. It's the putting it out on the internet. That's really the hard part. We don't actually need any money to do the show. Mm -hmm. We have all the equipment. It hasn't broken in a while. We have all the movies. Surprisingly, as people listen to the shows and download them more, uh, our server, who I don't even want to mention on the fucking show, just milks the shit out of us. That's a pleasant image, by the way. If you want some more pleasant images, doublefeatureshow.com. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. There was some kind of incentive. How did that work? Uh, if you donate, then you get to... Be... Fuck it. I don't care. All right. So we're doing movies on the show next time. Yeah, we are. What are the movies that are on the show? We're going to do some uh, old new school American horror. Oh, yeah. That's kind of happening again, yeah. isn't it? All right. So we're going to do Bubba Hotep. Yes. And we're going to pair it up with Trick or Treat. Yes. Just give me an idea. I mean, a lot of people have probably already seen these movies. Mm -hmm. I know Trick or Treat was like a huge darling. It probably got more praise than it even deserved at the time it came out. And uh, awesome, and I love it. And Bubba Hotep, I guess Bubba Hotep's probably the same thing. Bubba Hotep right? is definitely the same. I think both films do some fascinatingly interesting things, and more importantly than how interesting is that they get away with it. Watch more fucking film. No, you say watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>